Welcome back to Best Practice, my masterclass series. My name is Daniel Kurganov, and today we're going to continue our work with Legato. If you haven't watched the first installment, I highly recommend that you do. Uh, I'm going to leave a link up above the video and also in the description, so you'll get a bit more historical context about Legato. Um, you'll have an understanding of the technical components and some exercises to develop it. And you'll also see me demonstrating with some of my favorite uh, lyrical passages from the violin repertoire. So today we're going to listen to a few well-known violinists and see if we can make some comparative observations about their legato playing. Now, the intention here is not to bash anyone or to say that someone is the best violinist or someone is a bad violinist. I definitely have my opinions and tastes, but my goal here is to specifically assess legato and things that are adjacent to that. Now, before we begin, take a moment to subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the bell icon so that you get notified when I release a new masterclass video. Also, I invite you to check out my Patreon page. This is the best way to support the work on this channel. And there you'll find videos and various other perks relating to music, uh, violin technique, and other things that I've released. When evaluating a violinist's playing, the famed Soviet pedagogue Yuri Yankilevich would first pay attention to tone production and then to the expressivity of legato. And he said, We have, to a great degree, lost the art of this stroke. A smooth legato is a color, cantilena, a long melodic line. These are the violin's strengths. The charm of legato must not disappear. Let's see if this art of legato is indeed lost and has disappeared, or if it's still with us. So I'm here at my computer and we'll fire up some examples and get started. So the first example here is from Beethoven's Violin Concerto from the first movement. And this is a very beautiful, tender moment when we go into G minor. And the first violinist we'll look at is Arabella Steinbacher. So let's check this out. Okay, now let's compare that to another violinist, um, Stefan Jakiv. So this is Stefan Jakiv playing the same exact excerpt. So what sorts of things did you notice immediately in terms of what you heard, in terms of what you saw about the movement of their bow? Everything we talked about in Legato. Let's see if we can break this down. So if we go back to Miss Steinbacher, watch how she draws her bow. It's pretty connected all the way, yes? Yeah, so you saw that, right? Her bow traveled without any sort of hiccups in the sound. Okay. See, it's not quite as smooth as Steinbacher's stroke. Right, there's a little bit of... I'm exaggerating, but... He has a very tender and beautiful sound, but I feel personally that Steinbacher achieves a true legato, and that allows her to 
create this sort of pull with that phrase. It's all sort of building and connecting. And remember, we talked about the gravity between notes. Our next violinist is Anzofi sophie Mutter. And I'll confess, I really like this recording. And this is uh, Mutter in her early 20s, I believe, with Karyan conducting. So she's really kind of in her prime here. Okay, I could definitely listen to that whole recording, but we won't right now. What I noticed was that there is this incredible pacing of the bow. And uh, if you watch it again, you'll see a, a bow distribution that allows her to achieve this. So to me, she combines that beautiful legato that Steinbacher was displaying, and yet uh, manages to have this incredibly uh, sensitive and um, tender, and sort of a tone that has a longing to it, um, similar to what I think Stefan Jakiv was, was going for, but with legato. So let's actually watch part of that once more, shall we? That control with the bow, that timing of those separate notes. That color. She's building it here and she's expanding. She keeps the tension, keeps the tension, and then releases it here. And remember, we said that legato doesn't mean that there aren't any notes that are brought out or gestures within a smooth line. So when, when she does this, I mean, I can't play like her, but those separate notes, they speak and they have a sort of longing to them, but they don't at all break that legato line, right? So that's, that's that bow control, that's the control of pressure and the total looseness of the arm and the hand. Okay, so let's go on to our next violinist. So this is a violinist named Christina Bowie. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And let's watch this. Okay, so I'll let you come up with your own observations based on uh, the analysis we did earlier. Um, but I'll just say that I think there's an emphasis on, on rich sound. Whether there's legato, I'm not sure. Um, it seemed to me that there was a lot of separation between notes. So let's uh, go on to Miss Hilary Hahn. Very efficient use of the bow. Yeah, so to me, the sound is not very open, it has a condensed quality to it which is very interesting uh, because even when it's very soft and tender, it still has this sort of laser focus. H Hillary is kind of the queen of efficiency and uh, like very efficient uh, bow movement. So you could see she wasn't even using the whole bow for some of those phrases when she could have. Um, now I think that's part of her interpretation. Uh, and certainly in terms of legato, we can say that things are very connected. Whether they had a kind of a golden singing tone is another question that's up to interpretation. 
So let's watch one more. So this is going to be um, Itzhak Perlman. Okay, you could tell there's also when the tempo fluctuates, we have a different approach to sound production. And in a very slow tempo, I find that it's easier to kind of feel that gravity between notes, but it's harder to create the entire line, right? Because you only have so much bow. Um, so I find it very impressive when people can take a very slow tempo and have enough bow to get you know, all the sound that they need on every note and, and, you know, fulfill the shape of the line. And I'm also very impressed when people use a fast bow, you know, in a, a slightly more brisk tempo, yet are able to connect everything and not sort of gloss over some of the notes. And I think Itzhak was, was really letting each note speak and connecting each note. Um, it was kind of a, a more simple interpretation. It wasn't very kind of flamboyant. It wasn't extremely... Uh, kind of enig and intimate, but uh, it was beautiful and I, I think it was a good example of legato as well. It's like the difference between or two different approaches. I, I tend to like the latter, the slower, tense and stretched version. Okay, now let's listen to an excerpt from the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, and this is from the second movement, the Canzonetta, and we'll have four violinists that we'll look at. So first it's Christian Ferrat, the great French violinist, student of Flesch and Inescu. So let's take a listen. <laughs> Okay, so this is kind of a, a, a more heroic interpretation, I think. It's, it's very rich in sound, and it's not kind of hiding away. And you notice he makes a lot of bow changes, right? Because he wants this big open sound. It's actually a very interesting topic. Do more bow changes necessarily mean that there is less legato? Unclear. To me, that sounded very connected and very integrated. Um, I didn't feel that the bow changes destroyed the connection of the sound. Okay, so let's listen to another example. So this is um, another violinist. Uh, her name is Jiwon Song. Let's check, take a listen to that. There, there's a bit of separation. There's sort of a speeding up of the bow and a, and a resetting every time. So it creates this, this gap, which to my ear, um, it, it doesn't sound like legato. There's definitely a different approach to legato between these two violinists. Um, let's listen to another violinist. This is Ilya Kaller. So you hear a really good connection between some of these lines. Mm. 
Let, let's go to the last violinist. We have Mr. Joshua Bell. We'll watch this again, and I want you to pay attention to something else now. One aspect of the legato, remember we talked about, was shifting. So pay attention to how he's shifting. See, it's almost like the shift itself is louder than, than the notes. Can you see that? To my ear, that really pops out. Um, and not to mention, there's a distinct lack of legato. It's very sort of, you know, I'm not saying that judgmentally necessarily, just objectively, there is no legato. There's a kind of a bouncing effect. So he's going for a very light sort of ethereal sound. It's not, he's not laying on the thick vibrato. You know, so to me that it's a little bit uh, disconnected and it, it lacks that sort of overarching structure where every note has a gravity and that we have this tension and longing for uh, the big leaps and the, the uh, coming down from those leaps. So. It's a matter of taste, of course, but uh, it's important to start analyzing recordings in this way. Let's look at an excerpt now from the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, and I actually played it as a demonstration in part one of this video, so you can check out my analysis of that. Uh, but let's see some other violinists playing this. So this is Ray Chan. Second movement. Okay, so let's compare, you know, without analyzing it right now, let's compare that legato with uh, Noah Bendix Baugli. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. I think he's a concertmaster in Berlin. interesting. Of course, Ray Chan is using more bowings, but as we discussed, bow changes don't disqualify you from a great legato. But you see what Noah is doing here. He connects that really beautifully. Let's watch Yehudi Menuhin. Very old video. This is still E minor, I promise. So you see that. Amazing connection, amazing connection. And watch that, that down bow. It almost looks fake. It's so good. Menuhin definitely came from a school where legato was emphasized. So you see this intense focus on connection there. Uh, let's look at another violinist. So here we'll have Joshua Bell again, because we love him. Legato or not legato? I'll let you decide. 
Let's look at David Oistrach. So this is audio only. Yeah, so I, I love this, how, how he stretches the end of that line to create connection. One very important technique in creating a legato is when you're approaching an arrival, it's very common to elongate one or two notes prior to that arrival, and it creates a sort of um, very round and connected landing, right? If you land, especially onto a, a downbow, abruptly, um, you're in danger of losing that legato line. So I think Oistrach demonstrates the right way to do this. Okay, one more audio only. This is Michael Rabin, um, recording from his youth. So there's a lot of care taken while he's shifting. That's one thing I notice, and that contributes to a beautiful legato. He has this kind of old school way of uh, of putting tenutos on, on almost every single note. He has this impulse vibrato that we talked about in the first video. And this is kind of inspired by Chrysler and, and violinists like that. So he's, in some sense, a, a kind of a more modern representation of, of uh, Chrysler style, um, similar to uh, Oskar Shumsky. Um, and this, this is evident in the way they vibrate, but also the way they shift their um, portamenti and and such. Let's go now to a piece by uh, John Williams. This is the theme from Schindler's List. And I'm going to play two recordings. Neither of them are Itzhak Perlman, um, just, you know, because many people know that recording. So I found two young violinists that I didn't know before. And uh, we have an interesting comparison here of uh, legato playing. So let's watch first uh, Simone Porter. Okay, and now we'll watch a violinist named uh, Patrick Rafter. Okay, so feel free to pause the video and you can form an opinion. And do you get the same feeling from watching versus listening? So to my ear, uh, Simone Porter has a kind of distinct separation uh, with every single note, kind of. And uh, Patrick had a slightly more connected legato in my, to my ear. Uh, important to, to watch his arm also. It, it kind of anticipates the string crossings uh, when they're going back to back. Uh, And that allows him to really connect. One more time, you can hear just the beginnings. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so two different approaches, and you know you can decide which you like more. Uh, let's go on to one more excerpt. This is uh, the Prokofiev Violin Concerto Number no. Two, and this is the very opening, uh, a famous violin solo line. So first, we're going to listen to Janine Jensen. Okay, and next we'll listen to um, Stefan Jakiv. Okay, and the last example I have is a violinist named Vadim Glusman. Okay, so you see three distinctly different approaches. This opening of, of the Prokofiev is crawling and it's like a slithery snake, right? And then there's a, a sense of kind of uh, molasses or some, some sort of dark, sticky matter. <laughs> right, it's that, that dissonance that we want to emphasize. So I don't know what you think, but to me, the legato emphasizes that dissonance more. Versus a kind of bouncier and, and spoken version. So finally, I'd like to show you a video from a masterclass by pianist Christian Zimmerman. And he's discussing legato here in a very interesting way. And in general, I think it's important to look at great pianists um, for ideas about uh, expression and just approach to the instrument because pianists have far fewer variables that they're dealing with, right? They have fewer tools than violinists, technically speaking. Um, and so they have to get involved with music right away. You know, they don't have to play open strings for like an hour a day for 10 years just to kind of sound beautiful on Twinkle Twinkle, which is very much the case with violin. They're immediately engaging the phrase, engaging connection. So in, in some sense, I think there's a more advanced approach, generally speaking, to legato. And uh, I find this little excerpt very interesting. So let's watch this. So this is a fast passage that Zimmerman is asking the student you play in, you to play it slow here. down. You play it here. I want you to play it there on the bottom of the key. Play it slowly, one note after another. But not like a machine. Play, play like legato, you know. Going from one note to another. Because, you know, this is why you do the wrong notes here, or why you have problems in going down the chord. Because you, there's no transmission between one finger and the other. You know, go from one finger to another, like a cat. Yeah, that transmission from one finger to the other, that smooth connection. You see how he's using kind of the, the choreography of the fingers and uh, integrating that with the motion of his arm um, that takes him, you know, all the way down the keyboard. Uh, I find that, that there's a real parallel there to, to violin playing. Yeah, the fingers have to be more active. Yes, yes, yes. You know, I think that student probably practiced this fast passage, you know, with rhythms, with with all sorts of kind of techniques to make it fast and articulate. And on a good day, I'm sure he can play it brilliantly. Um, but this idea of taking fast passages and practicing them as lyrical passages actually improves the virtuosity of the passage because you're really um, taking the time and, and space to consider what's between the notes. How are you transitioning from one note to the other? 
right? And some of that is preserved when you play it really quickly. Uh-huh. You know what? Sit down on the floor. Sit down on the floor like this. And now have the figure just hanging. Here, hanging. Yes. No hanging. hanging. The whole hand. We just talk hanging. about that as yeah. well. Yes, hanging right? on the last last finger. Just on this, just on this. The rest is hanging here. Everything is hanging. Okay? Now this. This is the second one, just hanging here. Yeah? So you have contact with the bottom of the key, right with the bottom of the key. And you go one note after another, look, like this. Okay? Contact with the bottom of the key, that, that's very interesting. So <clears throat> the way I interpret this uh, in violin speak is that we're not, you know, we're obviously using weight with the arm, but it's not that we're pressing into the string, we're pressing through the string, let's say. A friend of mine used to say, you know, we're, we're leaning into the instrument, but we're really going through it and into the base of our spine, like, like a line is drawn and you're, you're just, it keeps going. So it would, have, it would have kept going, but there's something in the way here. And so there's this dynamic um, weight that's being manipulated. I also find a similarity to martial arts where you have, um, like if you're punching through a piece of wood and you see like, somebody really skilled doing that through like 10 pieces of wood, you know, they're not punching the wood they're punching what's on the other side of the wood. You know, there is no wood. And that kind of philosophy is guiding their motions. Um, and it's a sort of momentum and it's a, a use of natural weight. Um, we shouldn't punch okay. the violin though. Try. It is wood though. You could probably punch through it. Yes, it's better. But this is hanging. This is not playing. This is hanging. Just Don't nothing. do it though. Yeah, look at that. So the whole weight Every of the, of the hand joints here, everything is, is loose, just on this. Except that no. point of contact. Yes. Right, and that yes. the student is still okay. a little bit stiff in some of the yes. joints. You see, this Doesn't is breaking that sometimes. Freedom, that. that range of yes. motion. Sometimes in all it's the breaking. Joints. So it's basically okay. We can stand. Basically, I would like to think more. We could call it legato, actually. Yes. It's going from one legato. note to another and feeling the bottom of the key. Gravity okay. between notes. In whatever position you are. Now standing is much more difficult, but... Look how active the fingers are. They're very active. They go from one hand, finger from one finger to another. So, you see, Zimmerman has this incredible sensitivity with his ear and with his eye and with his body. Um, he's able to really focus on what's between the notes. And that's ultimately what we're doing with legato, is we're trying to kind of erase um, and, and create an illusion of something that's, that's uh, one unified gesture. So I encourage you to watch that video again at some point, and then go back and watch those other violinists, or, or you, know, you can watch anyone you'd like, and look at it from that perspective. Like, do you see this natural weight, this natural connection between notes? Right? And as soon as you sensitize your hearing to that, it's like, it's like a bug and you, you'll never get it out of your ear and you'll always be looking for that in your own playing. Um, and naturally, your body will start to adjust and, and, and act differently in order to, to satisfy your ear.